Good morning. morning. The Savior is coming, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Let us rejoice. Uh, I think everybody knows me pretty well, but I'm Beverly Waddleton Johnson. I would encourage everybody to sign our red folder, especially visitors, so we can let you know what we have going on. Uh, there will be a family with children service at 5 o'clock in Joy Hall today. The traditional cand candlelight service will be at 7 this evening in the sanctuary. For the next two Mondays and Tuesdays, the office will be closed. That will be December 25th and 26th and January 1st and 2nd. Next Sunday, we will not have an 8.30 service. We will again have just the 11 o'clock service. Um, I'm going to add this. I thought about this this morning. Through the years, many times, I've said when something comes up that somebody was worrying about, oh, that's not life-threatening. I'll just poo-poo it off. And as I have matured in age and faith, I realize that are things that are soul-threatening that we need to pay close attention to. So let's welcome the Savior who will help save our souls. Let us rise and greet our neighbors. God is good, and all the time, I so hate to interrupt good hugging and fellowship, but I also hate for Gail to get started on a piece, and for us not be in a position to fully take it in. So I'm going to invite you to please be seated as we wake our way fully, more fully, into worship together. Gail, thank you.
was a lot of phases and stages to hold worship. But across the centuries, saints have considered it best to enter into the Lord's gates with singing and praises. And so I invite you to stand as you're able. Let's sing glory to God. Are we going to skip? Yeah, we're going to go straight to uh, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Do you know what? What? Okay, we are going to lift up our hands. <laughs> The focus of last week's message was that, while not so clear to our modern eyes, when the father ran to welcome his wayward child, it was most scandalous in the eyes of first century Jews. 
But the scandal does not end there, where it might be excused as a lapse in decorum, as if the father forgot himself. No, so as to emphasize how clearly, how completely reckless and wasteful this father is, Jesus portrays his violating every conceivable convention of his day. He cuts off the child's confession in midterm. He reclothes him from head to toe. He puts a ring on his finger, the credit card of the day, and he throws the boy a party. Even so, our homecoming is so much more than our being welcomed by God as one of his servants. No, our homecoming has us being received as guests of honor at a royal banquet. And so we pray. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we recall the affirmation of the psalmist that with you, O Lord, is unfailing love and plenteous redemption. And so to the previous candles of hope, faith, and joy, we light this morning the candle of Shalom. For yours, dear God, is complete and perfect peace, not just the gift of being welcomed home, but the promise that we shall be lavished with all that we need unto wholeness and completeness in Christ. Amen. As you're able, I'd invite you to stand. As we recall our faith and affirm it together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. seated. This time I'd invite you to make note of the prayer list on the back of the bulletin. The many people who continue to mourn and grieve for whom this day is a mixed blessing, bringing back great memories. But because of some of those very memories of intimacy, bringing some pain. Please pray for these. Pray as well for the many headlines we've seen that just have been so recurring and constant. Fighting in the Middle East and Ukraine flooding in the northwest and the northeast. 
Then to these I'd invite you to recall, recollect, recollect those who through this week asked you to pray for something. Prayer request this just a day or so for Claudette Dixon with good news that she's home. Sam reported the joy of an air conditioner fully restored in the fellowship hall. And yes, how long has it been? Yeah. I'm grateful this morning. He, he doesn't like limelight, but I sure am grateful for Reverend Dr. Mark Young who sure has, uh, boy, he's, he's more than helped me to be a pastor when I haven't been here in Quitman. And uh, I'm just grateful for his attitude, his spirit, his heart, his knowledge. Any other joys or concerns we could lift up? Yes, Mary Jane. In the coming prayers of the people, I will conclude each intercession, each petition with the world is waiting restlessly for you, O Lord. And your response will be, come, Lord Jesus, come. The world is waiting restlessly for you, O Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, O oh Lord, our hearts are restless until they find their only rest and home in you. Even so, we come to you as weary souls, acknowledging our place in a world that restlessly waits for you, O oh Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We're restless of and weary from the ways we've fallen short of your will and way for our lives. We come to you for the assurance of your love, your forgiveness, the promise of your ongoing love and power and presence in and for our lives. The world is waiting restlessly for you, O oh Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray for the church that all together, clergy and lady, we can make a clear path for you, O Lord, in our hearts and make ready a way for your coming, being revealed in all our land. Yes, Lord, the world is waiting restlessly for you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders, even as we pray for all the nations and their leaders, that they would be agents of peace, justice, well-being. The world is waiting restlessly for you, O oh Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray for the grace to listen that our hearts would be open to the Word of God and our lives transformed by it. The world is waiting restlessly for you, O oh Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray for compassion. We pray for our discipleship. That we may do the work of God in our time and our place and recognize God who is with us and people everywhere, everywhere. We pray for healing in body, mind, spirit, for ourselves, for those on our prayer list, those named this morning, for the homebound and shut in, 
for any and all who've committed their needs and concerns to us. The world is waiting restlessly for you, O Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Stir up in our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of the world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, who's taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Remembering even now, O Lord, those who made their way to your Son to lay gifts by his crib, we so too would come and lay gifts at your feet. We forbid it, Lord, that this should be the end of our giving, but only a rehearsal for all the days the weeks of our lives. We call you Lord and lay everything at your feet. Amen.
please remain standing for the hymn of preparation as we approach God's word, read and proclaimed. Lo, how I look rose ere blue. as you're able for a reading from the Holy Scriptures. In this season of Advent, and yes, we are embracing this morning as the fourth Sunday of Advent, pivoting towards Christmas Eve and its message this evening. We've been considering not just the way that God comes to us, but his invitation for us to come home to him, using the prodigal son as a model. And so a reading from Luke chapter 15, beginning, beginning with the 17th verse. When the boy came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I'll set out, I'll go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So the boy got up and went to his father. But even while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your servant. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
highway Travel where the westerly winds can fly Somebody tried to tell me <laughs> But they never got to oh, tell me why I never got to tell you why I gotta count on being born Come on, mama Come on, daddy But you want It's become a pretty good habit, isn't it? I engage a text and a theme through the week and a song comes to mind. And then you add to that a video of surprise returns and you get a strong feel for the deep emotions of this fourth Sunday at Advent and are coming home to God. But truth is, I believe, as great as the emotions of that song and, and these video clips are, they pale. I am convinced in comparison with the joy that surrounds our homecomings to God. The God who's come and the God of our coming home to. For those who haven't followed us the last few weekends, we have been taking the traditional theme of Advent, God coming to us. But we've joined it, as I've already said, with God's invitation for us to more fully come home to God. Come home for the holidays, or in its purest original form, come home for the holy days. And we've used the prodigal son as a model of our own homing to God, homecoming to God and God's grace. I mean, here in this prodigal is one who acknowledges a certain emptiness. He came to himself and acknowledged a homesickness apart from the Father. And here he turns around and sets his body and his heart towards home. Here's one who's greeted by a father who's most undignified as he defies the conventions of his days, running to meet and hug his son. And here this morning, we see the fuller, broader response of God's grace as father. He reclosed the boy. 
He puts rings on his fingers. Dr. Jim Fleming, the biblical archaeologist that I've hit you with over and over again, would remind us that the rings of that day were the credit cards of the day, sealing and affecting business. Altogether then, this father not only greets the son, but he fully restores the wasteful wanderer to, <clears throat> to his full position as son. John Wesley, the inspiring spirit of the Methodist movement, had a way of, he was quite methodical. <laughs> and he would categorize understandings of our faith, including stages of grace. Now, grace is grace, it's the same. But depending on where, where we are in our relationship with God, grace might be understood as doing different things. And we can see these stages of faith, these phases of grace in the story of the prodigal son. You see, for those awakening to God, God is, or grace is prevenient. Pre, before, then a, we've used it in Advent, come. Prevenient grace is the grace that comes before we ever do a thing. It stirs a certain wooing in our hearts that something's missing. It creates that hunger that says, there's got to be more. There's got to be more to my life. There's got to be more to church. There's got to be more to the faith life than what I'm experiencing. And this wooing, this homesickness has a way of saying, there's a hole in my soul that only God in God's realness and fullness can fill. Yeah, there is prevenient grace. Before we do a thing, it's beckoning us back home. But don't stop there. For the one who finally turns towards God, saying, I do to God, and experiencing God's initial greeting, grace is justifying. It's forgiving. It's cleansing. It's accepting of us. But don't stop there, as many do. Ultimately, God's grace, Wesley would say, is sanctifying. There in the beginning of the word, you can see the word sanctus, the Latin word for holy. In this case, God's grace not only woos us to come back home, it not only greets us as we come home, but now it wants to clean us up and make us holy. Here Wesley might say grace has its full and final say in our lives, fully, completely restoring us as children of the heavenly king, generating greater and fuller holiness over time in us and in our lives and in our communities. Now the Hebrews of Jesus' day and before might speak of this movement of grace as God's perfect shalom. Now in the English, we translate that word peace, and unfortunately, we miss the full meaning of the word shalom in the Hebrew because we turn peace into what? The absence of negative things, and most especially, the absence of war and conflict. But that's only half of what shalom contains. Shalom is God's full and whole and complete and perfect peace. So it's not only the cessation of conflict, but it is the addition of everything else we need in life to be full and complete and holy. Put it another way. Shalom is not just the prodigal son's being able to safely come home but it is his being given all that he needs to be fully restored in the family and to the larger community. You know, all this talk of peace, the cessation of conflict, reconciliation, going home, has me recalling one of my favorite stories of the season, conveyed first to me 
by an author named William White. It's a true story. In fact, a few years ago in 2004, Joy You Noel was created as a Hollywood film. It's the first time one of my sermon illustrations has been turned into a Hollywood film. But for all the ways I love the film, there's something in the way William White wrote it initially. A story of peace. Whole peace. Not just the cessation of conflict. At the expense of Borneo, I'd rather read it as he wrote it. On Christmas Eve in 1914, he writes, the first year of World War I, a strange quiet had settled on the Western Front, a welcome respite for many lonely soldiers in the trenches who had become all too familiar with the roar of canyons and the whine of rifles. As they reclined in their trenches for that Christmas Eve, Christmas Day truce, each man began to speculate about the activities of loved ones back home. Ah, uh, my parents are just finishing a toast to my health, I'm sure, said one. I can almost hear the church bells, said another wistfully. My whole family ought to be walking out the door to hear the concert of the boys' choir at the cathedral. This is eerie, said a third. But I can almost hear a choir singing. So can I, shouted another. And listening for a moment, it became clear to them that was singing from the other side. A few sturdy German voices were singing Martin Luther's Christmas song, From heaven above to earth I came to bear good news to everyone. Glad tidings of great joy I bring to all the world and gladly sing. When the hymn was finished, the English soldiers sat frozen in silence. Then a large man with a powerful voice broke into the chorus of God rest ye merry gentlemen. And before he had sung three bars, a dozen voices joined him. By the time he finished, the entire regiment on the English side was singing. Once again, there was an interlude of silence until a German tenor began to sing Stille Nacht, Silent Nine. This time, the song was sung in two languages, a chorus of nearly a hundred voices echoing back and forth across the trenches, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Someone's approaching, a sentry shouted, and attention was focused on a single German soldier who walked slowly, waving a white cloth with one hand and holding several chocolate bars in his other. Slowly, men from both sides eased out into the neutral zone and began to greet each other. And in the next golden moments, each soldier shared what he had with the others, candy, cigarettes, even a bit of Christmas brandy. In time, they shared the tattered treasures that were the pictures of loved ones that they carried. And this is the part that always gets me. I don't know why. And look on the internet, you'll see real pictures of what I'm about to describe. No one knows whose idea it was to start the football match or where the soccer ball came from. But with the help of flares, the field was lit. And the British and German soldiers played until they and the lights were exhausted. Then as quietly as they came together, they returned to their own trenches. Now, additional accounts of this story will be told, describing it as happening not just here, but in other places across the Western Line. There are also stories on how soldiers on both sides refused to pick up arms when the Christmas truce was over. Fighting would resume, sadly, but only as new soldiers were sent to that part of the Western Front. I'll grant you it's sad that it all did not affect a full and lasting resolution to the conflict. Still, not to be missed is the hint of God's full hope 
and joy and full peace played out between the foxholes one bleak midwinter of conflict ceasing, of foes reconciled, of boy soldiers returning home to loved ones amidst tears of celebrate me home. How lavishly, how extravagantly, O oh Lord, is your coming to us and welcoming us home. Not just greeting us, but dressing up us, us up again as your children. Restoring us to full sonship and daughtership. In your glorious kingdom. Closing hymn, the first Noel. Will be on the screens. You can see the page number for hymnal if you need, 245. But on this fourth Sunday of Advent, God's coming to us fully on display and is fully welcoming us. What are you going to do with the invitation to your soul? As we pray, as we commit, let us sing. Five o'clock service aimed primarily at families with young children. But don't fear, I know it's early. We'll give them birthday cake and candy canes to keep them awake. <laughs> what? And oh, we got punch. Thank you, Carol. Um, and so, but then it's seven o'clock. Sorry, older people. Um, we might have a few leftover candy canes. Hey, we might even have some leftover cake, but you'll have to eat it outside. But we hope to see it tonight as we fully celebrate his coming, his first coming, and embrace the many ways he's not through. Amen.